Welcome to Trash Arts Take, it's Series 3, Episode 10. I'm uh, Sam Ace and Bell, and I'm with Jackson Batchelor. Hey. And Jessica Hunt. Hey. And uh, Ryan can't be here, he's uh, got a bit of a headache, but you'll hear him very soon. Not in this episode, but you'll hear him soon-ish. He'll be back, basically. <laughs> so, today we're going <laughs> to... That sounds really ominous, Sam. It does, it, it sounds <laughs> a little bit too ominous. <laughs> Nonetheless, you've got me hosting today and we're going to be talking about dreams and nightmares within films, how they're used within cinema, and some examples. Now, when I first started thinking about this, my first thought went straight to the beginning of film in itself. When you think of uh, A Trip to the Moon, um, Unchi Nan Tulu, the first surrealist film, cinema, as soon as you could start filming, it wanted to build these dreamscapes, like, immediately. And it kind of ties in with these movements that were happening around the time, especially with surrealism, because you've got Salvador Dali and Louis Bumwell, and they just wanted to create these art through video medium of their own dreams. Well, I, I suppose when you've got a, a medium like that for the first ever time, you're not going to just want to recreate reality necessarily, no. are you? You're going to want to do something a bit more, um, I don't know, uh, uh, sort of capture something that you could, wouldn't otherwise be able to see. I think... Um, Surrealism is something that really it, it it taps into the sort of subconscious and 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 how our minds work and how we think in 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 that sort of like unconscious state of the you know the dream state. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree, and I mean like, that's dreams in in general, isn't it? Is always down to subconscious, and those particular films were also with the surrealist movement where they were against the bourgeoisie, so they were trying to show repressive kind of ideas within dreams if that yeah. makes sense yeah and a lot of it is i mean as you as you pointed out that it's uh it's repressed things so a lot of it is uh coming out in horror form um or or fears you know it plays on fears and the abnormalities of putting things together that that shouldn't necessarily be seen in the normal world uh, thoughts that can plague your mind. It's yeah, things that make you feel uncomfortable, and I, I think mm. that's because they reflect something of your own uh, mentality to you to a certain extent, and that's why dreams can be so um, disturbing uh, at times. Is because they are uh, a, a sort of insight into your own mind in this sort of hallucinogenic, obscure, ob obscure state. Um, yeah, and that's, I think, what like drives us to sort of uh, want to analyse those dreams, but particularly what drives us to sort of use dreams as a way to uh, get you to know a character. Because um, that's, like, so often in films, a, a dream will tell you exactly who that character is because yeah, you're yeah. able to relate to them in some way mm -hmm. through that. Yeah, because it could be even just through the, the absurdity of, like, um, people's neuroses. So, like, Kaufman does a lot of that. Charlie Kaufman does a lot of that of his work. <coughs> and with the um, with some of the dream stuff in um, Unshin Andalou, it is to do with the, the sexual desires and stuff and what they can't do and how they're constantly being like... There's a scene where he's desperately trying to get to the woman and everything's pulling him back. And eventually you see, like, a vicar's pulling him back. And, of course, dreams can just be an absurd sort of, like spinning reel of just craziness constantly mm. hitting you depending my favorite because yeah. <laughs> it all depends on what kind of vibe you're going for you know definitely well the thing is as well i mean we've all had those dreams that in 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 the midst of it when you're in that land it's either terrifying or alluring or it it evokes certain emotions but then you you snap into the real world you try to explain it or retell it, and it's it's just chaos. Even the good dreams, it, it, it makes zero sense, and sometimes they can be outright boring, <laughs> you know, to, to, to other people. But to you, there's this emotional adventure with wrapped up in, in inside it, you know, and it's always very visual. Mm. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, the way that so many films will, like uh, I've seen sort of uh, in Charlie Kaufman's films, for example, um, a lot of it uh, moves in this sort of aimless direction, uh, like dreams do, um, where 
the narrative only sort of really becomes uh, clear by the end of it of, of what has actually happened. You know, you, you, you sort of jump around different genres, different um, characters, different ideas. Um, and uh, I suppose David Lynch is, is a similar one as well in that, in that sense wow. where there's just no predictability to where yeah, you're yeah. going or how it's going to end up. Um, and then only after you've sort of seen the whole thing can you really have a, a perspective on it and, and totally. sort of reflect on it. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like a puzzle that's just been chucked, yeah. you know, and all the pieces are scattered everywhere. Mm. When you're looking at dream sequences, it, it works a lot like that, where um, you're not, you're not going to have a, the full picture. You're just going to get parts of the picture in a mess, in a chaos. To um to go back to good old David Lynch because you mentioned mm. him. Yeah. Lynch is like the king of creating that <laughs> dreamscape where you're not sure whether you're experiencing a dream or a nightmare. And uh, personally, the film that really does that well for me is Mulholland Drive. Now I'm biased. Ah, I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna go with something else, but carry on. Well, Mulholland Drive is literally a split story of the dreamlike idea of what Hollywood is, where there's a bit of mystery and you're gonna get chosen and you're that special talent until halfway through where it switches to the nightmare idea of the seediness and you're never going to get anywhere and it's just vengeance. And it's like the most d direct sort of sense in that regards. And even, because Lynch is a good guy, like he loves that dream like with the music and stuff. He loves dream pop, but he loves to bring in those more softer sort of sounds. But then when he goes into a nightmare, you don't know what you're going to see. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. it's always a harshness and, 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 there's, and there's such a contrast it literally feels like one is so much more brighter and the other one is pure darkness and uh, Mulholland Drive just balances it so well and it does it with the performance as well of Naomi Watts where she's all stereotypically oh my look at Hollywood look how beautiful it is almost Wizard of Oz-esque you know with the sort of oh wow and then when he gets into Nightmare she's a real person a very angry person but a real person yeah, and there's a lot of that in in like uh, David Lynch's work, particularly. Yeah, it's yeah. like this just switch between um, uh, narratives, uh, and like Lost Highway sprung to mind as you're sort of talking about that, where uh, you know the character is put in jail and then suddenly he's someone else and yeah. uh, they've arrested him by accident and then they let him out and he goes about his own life, which is entirely different to the character that we've been following up until that point's life. And uh, it's it's a really sort of bizarre, bizarre moment in a film that changes the narrative almost entirely, but um, it's a consistent gives you a thing different it, view it? of the same kind of world in mm. some ways. It's it's yeah. Well, if we go back to like his first film, have you seen Razorhead, Jess? I've not. No. See, that's a nightmare <laughs> from the soundscape, from the coloring, from the because he he's got this thing about like absurdism within norm normality. Like repetition of certain lines it happens a lot also mm. in um twin peaks um and it's like it really it, i don't know it puts you in a very weird, weird place and because we know that a lot of lynch's stuff is uh what's it called transmeditation he does a lot of that stuff so he would um from what i've heard he meditates and meets the characters that are going to appear so it's all oh, I like that yeah it's kind of crazy but it's always going to be within some sort of dreamlike state that he's doing these yeah. creations. And, and almost unled as well. Yeah, and it, and it bleeds through perfectly in the films. Mm. More, more so than like uh, so, some films can do. Because dreams, dreams are hard to shoot in films. It's hard to get the context right. It's hard to not feel like you're trying to create absurdism when it's all just rolling through like with dreams. You know what I mean? Like dreams are rambling things when you try mm -hmm. to recreate it it can seem a little bit sterile yeah because it's uh how do you like your your natural way of storytelling you you almost have to turn everything on its head mm. and that's the thing what lynch would do is he'll take somewhere like uh, suburbia and give it all that sheen of hey this is white america this is the white america you know it's all good it's all dreamlike but then everything behind it is a nightmare Especially yeah, in, uh, it's the uh, it's the light and the dark, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The contrast. When we um when we dive though completely into the dark, you come to Freddy Krueger. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Mr. Uh, Night Terror himself. 
Yeah, and those films are really about lucid dreaming. It's about the idea mm-hmm. of controlling, being not well, not having the control in your dream. Are having, you awake? Yeah, it's it's a very. Yeah. Freddie always terrifies me, and he always will. There's as soon as I watched that as a kid, and you actually start having dreams about Freddy Krueger, and it's just and now and then throughout your life you get a Freddy nightmare, and you're like, here he is, he's back, he's back into existence. I think um, that that's the thing with. Uh, with like uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, the, the 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 whole sort of franchise, it it was able to do sort of uh, very different kind of dream scenes um, because where you know the uh, the the scenes like, like films of David Lynch is the whole film is is like a dream and it's yeah. never really mm-hmm. stated that it's a dream. It's never really stated that um, you know that that who the character who might be dreaming it is. It's it's just separated from that. Mm. Um, the, the, the yeah the, the uh, Freddy Krueger sort of appears in their dreams and so there's like this the, there's so often these moments that they sort of make you think that it's reality and then something so surreal and, and so strange and, and nightmarish happens that breaks that illusion of reality mm. and uh, yeah it's interesting because it obviously does it in a, in a different way it presents the dream differently in that sense yeah, there, there's this uh, false sense of security, isn't there? Mm, yeah, the, yeah. the the Freddy movies. Uh, sometimes it's completely completely absurd. Like there was obviously that opening scene where he's like the Wicked Witch of the West. Oh yeah, <laughs> Freddy's dead. Um, yeah. But then, but then a lot of the 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 main predatory moments is where people have no idea or no suspicion that they're asleep. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then, you know, there's there's his uh, his inter- interesting decision to to kill them and the fact that the, the way he kills them is is always very creative. <laughs> it's always um, you know personally connected as well. I mean, like to to the point where it's just slasher stereotype of a character. You're you're a geek, so you play computer games. Great, you're going to die in a computer game scenario. But it's still yeah, like feels it's like he, close. it's almost like Freddy Krueger gets to the point where he's like, okay, this is this is my domain. Anything goes. Yeah, but I, I think that like where it's sort of almost personalised to them, that's that that plays into that idea of the dream in the first place. That, that yeah, this yeah. is something internal. This is something that um, uh, comes from within in the first place. And so something that's close to you, killing you or, or being a part of the way in which you die in this nightmarish, horrific fashion makes mm. perfect mm. sense. Uh, in that, well, it will, that it will continue with you even after you've woken up. Yeah, exactly. Because it's part of your actual life. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Which, um, sorry about that. That's my sushi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the buzzer. Um, but which takes me nicely to um, so like Inception. So obviously, like there's there was those uh, the is it the, what's the item that they use that spins? I can't remember. I can't think of what it's called. It's not... But you know what I mean. I'm gonna say thimble just for the sake of <laughs> having a word. Um, but then obviously, like the fact that that they use like a token of like. This is how you know if you're awake. It's the it's the equivalent of pinch me, you know. Yeah. yeah. Am I awake? And uh, I think that's the main thing with with uh, especially the daydreams or like the illusion of what's real. Um, and like Final Destination, another one, another good example of where um, people are awake, they are experiencing something physically, mentally, emotionally, and all of a sudden, even when they're zapped back into a moment of reality, the, the, the uncertainty of their own safety causes nothing but panic. Yeah, yeah. You know, loss of control, complete loss. It's interesting as well, because obviously with Final Destination, it ties into another kind of dream, where a dream is an indication of what's going to happen later in the mm. film, or is the person kind of crazy. Have you ever seen um, Take Shelter? No. Uh, it's a film with uh, Michael Shannon, and it's essentially about a guy who starts having dreams and visions of the world mm. coming to an end. And he starts trying to tell people, no one wants to listen to him, they think he's a bit crazy, he's recently lost I think job. I might have, actually. Just looking at the, the picture, it does look familiar. Yeah, so it's a really powerful way to be able to do it, where you're questioning your own sort of, well, is this guy crazy or not? Because it doesn't give you the, the bigger fantastical picture, it spends more of the time with him and these dreams that are constantly experiencing. Mm-hmm. And I think whenever you have those sort of, your, I, I can't remember what the word is, but when you're prophesizing, essentially, having a dream in that respect, it's, uh, 
<clears throat> it's an interesting one in films because it's up to the the creator to decide whether that's going to happen or not. Donnie Darko is a perfect example. I was of that. just going to say, yeah, it's that. Is it is it an actual premonition or is this person, you know, slowly losing grip of reality? <clears throat> yeah, and it's and it's up to the director how they want to where they want to go with that. Yeah, mm. I I think that, that that's the thing about dreams and dream sequences in films is that where there's like no rules, there's no sort of uh, boundary, um, you can you can really sort of delve into a, a, a really like creative image. Um, mm. I mean, thinking back back to Inception again, um, the way that the sort of physics worked within the dreams, yeah, um, yeah. the way that. Uh, you know the, the, the what was it the, the like the folding ground uh, that was moment. so cool. Um, uh, you know that there's something that you can do in dreams that just aren't it is not possible in reality uh, or, or believable um, in reality, um, and yeah, it really opens up that sort of creative, uh, uh, yeah, creative ability to sort of mm. show a character in a, in a in an entirely different way or show a world in. Entirely different way. Inception does is an interesting thing because obviously that's one of those rare cases where you've got quite an intelligent blockbuster, mm. and it is an action film after all. Yeah. And to put those sort of James Bond scenarios, it's kind of interesting because when we dream, sometimes we do dream that we could be a spy running around doing stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just in the film they they kind of do it in this way where everything's still serious. Yeah. There's still real stuff at stake. <laughs> Yeah, because obviously, if you die there, you die, you die. Well, that's um, a, that, that, that's why I think that like that use of that that um, that sort of creative look at dreams of that physical kind of realm, it was more appropriate for that than than say you know a, a look at sort of someone's psychology in that kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. surrealist way that you would. Well, it's almost like you're tapping into various layers of reality based on who the individual is, mm. um, which kind of plays on, on you know, like there's, there, there are some people in the world who, like Yuri Geller, you know, who uh, believe that you can literally affect your reality with your mind. Yeah. And that's kind of the same thinking, if you see, like with the way that, that certain realities can, can alter depending on who the individual is. Well, again, um, it goes back to Donnie Darko, doesn't it? Yeah. Because there's a similar kind of themes within that sort of idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, and like I kind of revisited, because of the subject, I revisited a few uh, movies that, in my mind, uh, gave me this kind of sensation, but not necessarily the obvious one. Okay. Um, so do you remember the film The Gift? Oh, that's the... Um, she's a psychic, premonitions... Yes. Um, so that she wasn't necessarily asleep, um, but she was getting visions um, that were very much like a dream in the daytime. Yeah. And they were they were um, quite prominent in terms of um, how, like, so she she knew that they would only be seen by her. You know, I think the whole idea of that story was the fact that she was technically the only witness to a crime. Because she had a vision of it. Yeah, I remember that. It's Sam Raimi, isn't it? It's um, yes. what's his face? Uh, Keanu Reeves and Kate Blanchett. Funny, I swear that's the only time I've seen Keanu Reeves play a bad guy. Yeah, he does it really well as well. You do, yeah. you do more of it. Well, that's that's the thing I think that's interesting about like visions and and dreams and um, uh, hallucinations as well is that they all fit into sort of a similar category and and get shown in kind of similar ways in in film particularly um and uh i don't know i think that you know they are almost akin to one another aren't they really i think it's interesting when a film uses it to bleed over so um repulsion and <clears throat> well more so repulsion to be fair hmm. the dream sequences they're so horrible and she's constantly having these dreams where she thinks she's being attacked and they just completely drown out all of the, like, the diet, di, di, oh, I can't remember the word. They drown out all the sounds in the room, and instead you can just hear a ticking clock. Yeah. She's trying to call okay. out, 
it, it's the ticking clock of where she's sleeping. So, that, you know, she she's asleep and she can just hear the ticking clock yeah. in the background. But, you know, you're seeing these horrific actions, but just with that sound. And it's it, just yeah, men so constantly disturbing. just, like, trying to get at her. And because her mind's slowly mm. losing it, this starts to bleed into reality where she's, where arms are coming out the sides trying to grab at her and stuff. And it, it's it's uh, it's quite nightmarish in that respect as opposed to being, you know, like, dreamy. It, yeah. It's more just th- that this primal fear that's constantly with her is just bleeding through, essentially. And we've all experienced that, you know. There is this, there is this kind of, like, middle stage when you're both either falling asleep or trying to wake up, you know, where you are kind of in this limbo place yeah. where you, you, you are both in the real world and your dream state. Yes. And that's obviously, like, the the realm where night terrors happen. Yeah, which um, actually, because I, I love the documentary The Nightmare. Mm, which does watched awesome. that recently because of, uh, of our chats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way they do that as they treat it like it's like a network and they're being tuned into different networks. It's one of the most fascinating ways I've ever seen any film or in this case documentary talk about sleep paralysis and nightmares mm. in that respect. Well, it is a network, really, because much like uh, how they 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 explain Freddy uh, Krueger, very nearly said Mercury. Then don't know why. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, is the fact that the only reason why people start to dream about him is because they start to talk about him. Yeah, they're willing it into reality. Yes, and this is the only con- logical conclusion that people ca- have come to with sleep terrors, night terrors. And the, the, the similarities that have come come up in people's terrors um, is that it, it's a power of suggestion. Mm. It's weird as well, because <clears throat> you, you see a lot more do- films about sleep paralysis nowadays, like, especially independent films. It's becoming a thing that people can throw into. I think it was even an American Horror Story. But the only mm-hmm. other film that really came close to what The Nightmare did is probably uh, Insidious. Yes. Because yeah. that really did give you that sleep paralysis vibe of um, astro... Is it astro... The, yeah, astral projection. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, astro yeah. turf. I was going to say <laughs> astro surfing. So. Astro surfing. That, <laughs> astro surfing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, almost like this predatory, you know, like the fact that you can leave your body and something is waiting for you. Yeah. So it can steal your body. Yeah, yeah, and I, I it's it because it, it is like a dream state. It is like and and sort of certain ideas about like astral projection is sort of similar to like stepping into your mind to go into the world kind of thing. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of crazy, it but is, yeah. but at the same time, like you can see how that's that's so much like a dream, and, and the mm-hmm. way that they play that seat those scenes in Insidious is very very much dreamlike. Um, yeah, you know, everything's kind of broken up into these sort of still images of flashes of moments in certain ways and you know the, even the way they move around it and stuff and the smoke and everything like mm. that they, yeah yeah it's, it's otherworldly yeah and it, it, it kind of again harks back to the sort of 80s films when you have nightmare scenes they are very wind everywhere smoke's flowing the colors are streaming everywhere <clears throat> i mean a lot of giallo films are very dreamy like and it's it's very prevalent in um the beyond Do you remember the beyond the intense film where they end up in hell at the end. There's so there's so many moments oh, in that film which are so absurdly ob- obscure and strange. There's one point where a character is covered in spiders, and Ooh. it takes so long, and it's a mixture of what feels like macro shots on the spider and then puppets, but because it's mixing in there and it's going for so long, and it's all this lead up of just nastiness. It's still very dreamlike. Mm. I think sometimes the perfect horror film can feel like you're in a constant loop of a nightmare. Yeah. So, yeah, that takes me on to The Shining, which is obviously, like, where the dreams are slowly becoming the norm. Mm. You know, they they sort of tap away, and then eventually they engulf the character, you know, to the point where he's no longer he's no longer mentally in the real world. 
Yeah, and and I think like the, the Shining does the same thing as as a lot of dreams where, where like dreams in films where where the geography will will be entirely off and something about the whole sort of setting of it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. Uh, you know that narrative, like the way that it's told, particularly you know even even in the intro where you're sort of flying over the trees, following the road, it feels so dreamy. It feels so yeah, um, yeah. And uh, Doctor Sleep, uh, you know, is, is you know that. I mean, it felt like that uh, that moment of hovering above and seeing something above, and, and you know, in Doctor Sleep, obviously, you see more of that. You see yeah, the character yeah. actually flying through the sky and landing and in a certain position of that astral projection sort of thing. It is so disorientating, especially mm. with um, the way it's shot, the way the Mike Flanagan kind of moves up and then just sort of tilts, and you're moving yeah. with it. It's, it's a very like, un, uncomforting kind of experience. Yeah, you, you feel like you're falling with him in that scene. And mm. it's, it's very that reminds me of, um, have you ever seen the film Eight and a Half? Uh, no, is that Fellini? I think so. I'm not going to try and pronounce his name. <laughs> I'm just going to say yes. Um, but again, the opening scene of that uh, is essentially a nightmare, and uh, he's he's in a car in stuck in traffic, and ev everything like so. It, in some aspects, it's perfectly normal, but then there's certain things that are played out visually that that make it very clear that it's not real life. Like there's this quite ominous feeling of all these arms just hanging out of um, the bus and they're all it's almost like perfect so it's almost like um, they've 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 just been placed there and no one's moving or uh, the the people around them in terms of the traffic like this their movements are quite strange and uh, and then there's another scene where he he's floating and he he himself is essentially the balloon, and on his ankle is a is a rope that uh, brings him down to the, in someone's hand, you know. So he's almost being flown like a kite, and um, it's it's obviously like these re repetitive uh, scenarios where he's he's in familiar grounds, but the setup is totally off. Is it played off for uh, absurdism? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of it is because he's a director yeah. and he's trying to create this movie, um, but his dreams are just completely balmy, and he's uh, he almost narrates his own existence. I think because there's a lot of surrealism around the same time, because I know it's um, yeah that that mixes the absurdism with dreams, and that mono that repetition, as you say, and that slightly everything's just a little bit off kilter to some degree. I think. Um, that kind of the one last thing I wanted to like properly look over with dreams was to talk about the ridiculousness of some scenes within dreams. Mm -hmm. um, we've all seen the Big Lebowski. Yep. If you remember the scene where he has a dream, I think he's been drugged and he has the dream about bowling, and it's all so obvious on all of the subconscious levels we play for comedy of the Oedipus and. Um, he sees Saddam Hussein and he's just floating through the dream, <laughs> going in between the legs. And it's he's having the whole thinking that the um, nihilists are going to come after him, that their scissors are going to cut off his penis. And I, there is sometimes with dreams where you can go to such a silly, ridiculous level that it's still playing on all the same ideas because you know the character, you've seen the rest of the story. And comedy can have that great effect where you can go, all right, let's just elevate all of that and just throw it at you for for fun as opposed to scaring the hell out of you. Yeah, it's think... totally fun, it's totally play, but also it can kind of, in terms of like a filmmaker, there's there's one, there's, there's a way of delivering some piece of information that you can do it in such a an unusual way. But also, as we all know, it can also be that terrible way of getting out of a plot twist. <laughs> which we should all avoid <laughs> yeah i i think that um like on your point sam with the with the sort of ridiculousness i, I think that like they're almost like the same thing in some ways because when you think about 
like really terrifying moments in dreams and films or, or, or even really terrifying moments in your own dreams they're really quite ridiculous when you think about yeah, them yeah. in the sort of in in the uh you know in hindsight looking back on the dream um whereas in the heat of the moment they can be terrifying and i, I think that like there's a there's a thing about that where something is so ridiculous that it's but it's also terrifying um, uh, you know, uh, and that seems to be something that I, I feel like I see a lot in films is, is you know, that bizarre, uh, I don't know, uh, duality to, to mm. something. There's one film that kind of actually pulls a bit of a contrast there. It's a film called uh, The Science of Sleep. And essentially, okay. it's about a dysfunctional human being or just guy who doesn't really have a handle on his life and doesn't really know where he's going, falling in love with people, but they're not really interested in him. But in his dreams, he runs it all like it's a TV show and everything's going perfectly. Ah. So he's, he's taking control of his life through his dreams. And of course, after a while, the, the two kind of like filter through where he just can't have any handle on either of what's real and what's not. <clears throat> It's uh, Michel Gondry who did uh, Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind. I was going to bring that one up. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. It's, those, it's the modern surrealists coming back to like Kaufman and uh, Gondry. And I just think with Science of Sleep, the way they do it is they do uh, a lot of um, kind of stop motion stuff with cardboard, uh, stuff like he did in um, Be Kind Rewind. So it's all that kind of style. So the dreams do feel like they're being constructed as they're going along, like, but it's in a very mm. childlike mindset. And I think that's the other thing with when you see in films at least, if someone's holding on to their dreams more, it's because life hasn't turned out how they thought and they want to go back to being children where nothing was as serious or meant as much. And the film does it beautifully. I think I'm one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> now that you put it like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And well, like you said about the... the um, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind he literally regresses to a point where he was a child yeah and uh, i do think that a lot of uh untapped memories and uh messages come through in your dreams and it's normally to do with trauma or how you've dealt with it or how, how you're not dealing with it yeah that actually brings me back with kaufman being john malkovich when mm. you can be John Malkovich for 15 minutes, but when they all start diving into it, they start diving into all these subconscious, horrible traumas that John Malkovich has experienced in his mm. earlier life, which in some ways is them running through his dreams. It's running through all the things that he, because he can't, he's not there at that time. So it's sort of going through dreams in some ways. It's like the subconscious, if you're not facing it in your current, you know, conscious mind, day to day it will find its way to you yeah mm. yeah and there's so many films that can do that and it's good to see that there's always dreams are always going to be there we're never going to stop dreaming so there's always going to be new ways to have a look at dreams in fact there's a new film that's coming out soon a horror film where they literally look at dreams because of nightmares a girl is experiencing uh, the film's called come true i don't believe it's released in this country yet but again, just the fact that there are always ideas of how to tell dreams in films. It's never going to go away. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think it gives such an opportunity to do things like so creatively where, where you know, um, certain rules of, of the way that you shoot something don't necessarily apply. You can, you can do uh, very different things. You can stay entirely in, uh, in close-up. You can stay entirely in wide and make it um, mm. feel really, really distant you can sort of play with the with the fabric of the world that they're in you can make a blank void or or, or some kind of uh, desert or something you know you can you can do anything yeah. in a dream um and all of it can be used to sort of build up the character that you're actually sort of following or, or looking at yeah um and so you know everything means something in that context um and i don't always buy into that everything means something in in a scene but I think when it comes to dream scenes, uh, you know, that it gives you the opportunity to really do that. And uh, yeah, because the thing yeah. is, no dream has no dream lacks depth. There's mm -hmm. always something there. So to use that in a film and not utilize it as a tool mm -hmm. feels kind of <clears throat> feels kind of pointless, really. Yeah. Yes. It's the it's a perfect opportunity to break a bunch of rules. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we'll finish up there. I think that was a good chat. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for joining us again, Jess, and hopefully we'll, see, we'll get you back on in two weeks' time if you're up for it. Yeah, no problem. And yeah, everybody, uh, subscribe to the channel, like, share, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Trashart.co.uk. <laughs> um, what's the other one he says? Uh, click the bell. That's the one. Ring a ding ding. Um, <laughs> and please join us again next week when we'll be having a round table with Michael Fausty, Tom Lee Rutter, and Robbie Hampstead talking about a genre that I, well, not so much a genre, but a certain type of horror films, Hammer horror films. And I'll confess, I know nothing about Hammer horror. Oh. So this is education. So yeah, join us next week and uh, we'll talk later. Well, we won't talk. You get the picture. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Ta-da.